Hey guys, it's Mrs. Invest. When making your own DIY investing portfolio, you've probably thought about the mix of cash, stocks, ETF, bonds, and maybe fixed income that you wanna hold based on your age and your investment goals. And that's called asset allocation. That's different from today's video topic, which is called asset location, which basically means where you hold these different types of assets and distribute them through your investment accounts like the TFSA, the RRSP, and the non-registered account. So asset location basically means which assets to hold where and why. So why is asset location even important in the first place? Well, because not all investment income is taxed the same way. And depending on the type of income an asset generates, it is actually can be taxed completely differently. For example, interest income is taxed totally differently than income generated from Canadian eligible dividends. And paying attention to the type of income that your assets are generating and stashing certain assets in their optimal account can really help you keep more of your after-tax investment income, basically allowing you to generate wealth faster. And what a lucky bunch you are, if I do say so myself, because over the last more than decade of all the concepts I've had to learn myself when it comes to learning about DIY investing, I would say the topic of this video probably was the most confusing for me, took me the longest to nail down, and the information is so hidden, it's so hard to find. I could not find all the answers that I needed in one place. So that's my goal for you in this video today is to really nail down in one place, short, succinct, and easy to understand what are the best types of assets to hold in which of your investment accounts, the TFSA, the RRSP, and the taxable account. I honestly wish this video existed when I was starting because it would have helped me a lot but there you go uh, I am giving back to the world I guess so I hope you guys enjoy this video I'm gonna do my best to make it as easy to understand if there's something that you think I didn't explain well or you have more questions just comment below and I'm pretty good at getting back into the comments and one more thing I want to absolutely emphasize about the topics in this video if you are confused if this makes no sense to you if you think this is over your head do not worry, these concepts are all gravy. They're the icing on the cake, they're the cherry on top when it comes to investing. They are the small piece in a much larger puzzle and none of what I'm gonna talk about today is nearly as important as the main concept which should be investing as early as you can in your life and as consistently as you can month to month. If you locate your assets in the worst possible accounts for your entire life and hold everything in the least ideal place possible, if you start earlier than someone else, you will still almost certainly be farther ahead than the person who started 20 years later than you and located everything perfectly. So just remember, this is not, doesn't have to be perfect. It's not an exact science. All right, let's get into it. So the first thing you have to understand when it comes to asset location is you need to know or have a benchmark comparison for an after tax return. What do I mean by that? How do you know if an investment is tax friendly or has a good after tax return? Well, you don't unless you have something to compare it to. So I personally like comparing my after tax investment income to earned income or employment income that you get at your job. There's a couple reasons for this. If I say my capital gain, I bought a stock, I stole the stock, and I pay 25% tax total on the sell. What does that mean to you? It doesn't really mean much, but if I say, well, I had to pay 50% tax on my employment income on the same amount, all of a sudden you understand it. You're like, wow, the capital gain is twice as good, right? So that's one reason I like to use employment income as a comparison. And the second reason is because it's easy for people to understand how hard or how long you have to work for, let's say, $1,000 compared to, if you're talking about $1,000 of a capital gain, it's very abstract. So you'll hear me in the video comparing returns compared to working income. And I just personally like that comparison and I'm generally comparing it to let's say the standard benchmark of a person living in Ontario who's paying in the top tax bracket on the upper end of their income, which is about 53% tax on every dollar they earn. So if they earn a dollar more that year, they're paying 53 cents of tax to the government and they're keeping 47 cents. So that's generally my benchmark of how I compare all investment assets to. Okay, and the second thing you have to understand about asset location is to know how different types of investment income are taxed 
taxed in Canada. So depending on the income that your asset generates, it can be taxed and will be taxed completely differently. So using this person in Ontario who's at the top tax bracket, let's go through and rank the different types of asset generating income from heaviest tax burden, meaning you pay the most tax per dollar earned on this type of income, to the lightest tax burden, meaning you pay the least amount of tax per dollar earned on this type of investment income. So in sixth place with the heaviest tax burden, we have interest income. This could be from a savings account, fixed income, GICs. These have the highest tax bill of any type of asset. And this person in Ontario, if he generated $1,000 in interest income, he would be paying $535 of tax. In fifth place, we have foreign dividend dividend income and this means as a Canadian non-Canadian or non-US dividend income so a dividend from any other country in the world and it's the same tax burden as interest $1,000 generated this way will have a tax bill of $535. In fourth place, we have distributions from REITs, from real estate investment trusts. Now the tax burden on these can vary, but it's generally the same as the previous two, which is $1,000 generated from uh, REIT distributions will have a $535 tax burden. Now these three are taxed just as heavily as employment income. So a dollar generated from any of these three is the same as a dollar generated through you working a job. In third place, we have Canadian eligible dividends. And thanks to the Canadian dividend tax credit, we get a bit of a tax break when we get paid out Canadian dividends. So $1,000 paid of Canadian dividends, you will pay a tax bill of about $393. The second best way to generate investment income for a low tax bill is capital gains. So $1,000 made of capital gains, which is you buy a stock, you sell a stock for $1,000 more, it will generate a tax bill of $267. And the number one way to generate tax-friendly investment income in Canada is marrying rich. $1,000, priceless. No, but really it's capital gains. And the third thing you need to understand about asset location is how to hold the right investments in the right account. And you can save yourself a lot on taxes if you hold certain investments in their optimal account. So let's break down between the RRSP, the TFSA, and the non-registered account, what are the best and worst investments to hold in each of these accounts. Starting with the RRSP or the RIF, I have a full video on the RRSP, which I'll link up here if you wanna watch it. Basically, this is a tax deferred account, which means money's not taxed while it's in the account. It only gets taxed once you withdraw the money out of the account. So the Canada, the Canada, <laughs> Canada and the US have a tax treaty between them when it comes to US dividends and US interest income. There is a withholding tax that you normally have to pay as a Canadian if you receive a US dividend or US interest income between 15 and 30%. In the RRSP, due to this tax treaty, this is not the case. So what to hold in your RRSP are U.S. individual stocks that pay out dividends, especially U.S. stocks that pay out a high dividend. What to avoid holding in your RRSP would be Canadian dividends. Not that they're bad to hold, but you can't claim the Canadian dividend tax credit when you eventually go to re remove the money. And capital gains, you kind of lose the benefit of the good tax treatment on capital gains and the money will just end up getting taxed when you withdraw the funds out of the RRSP. And the last thing would be any foreign dividend or foreign income uh, foreign income that is not US so like international because uh, you can't claim the foreign tax credit in in a registered account so in my RRSP this is where I have focused most of my US individual stock holdings I'm off the top of my head trying to remember my Apple stock is there my Microsoft stock is there the majority of my Tesla stock is there um, and some of my US um, broad market ETFs um, like SPY is there. It's uh, listed on the US exchange and the dividend that gets paid out is in US dollars. So those are the types of investments that I hold in my RRSP, mainly because of this tax treaty that helps with reducing or re removing the uh, withholding tax. Okay, and next we have the TFSA. I have a whole video on the TFSA as well and I'll link it at the top again. 
Here, the income you generate in the account is not taxed and it's not taxed when you withdraw it either. There is no tax. It is an investment paradise. So what to hold in your TFSA? Number one would be safe capital gains. And by safe, I mean, don't gamble with high risk, high reward, either make a lot, lose a lot, because you can't claim any capital losses within your TFSA. So if you find a stock and you are just so sure that over the long term it's gonna go up with a very minimal downside, sure, that would be a great investment in your TFSA, but focus on capital gains that you personally would consider safe because if you are playing something risky and you end up with a loss, you lose that contribution room in your TFSA and you can't claim the loss either. The second thing would be Canadian dividends. Although you can't claim the Canadian dividend tax credit in the TFSA, you don't pay any tax on the dividend either. So those dividends can be fully reinvested to use their maximum value in order to buy more shares of whatever you want. And the third would be REIT distributions. Um, REITs, uh, as we talked about, they have, their distributions are taxed as ordinary income, so they're taxed quite heavily. And on top of that, REITs generally pay out a pretty healthy yield, especially this past year when a lot of the REITs got totally hammered due to the crisis. So some of the yields went up to like 10%. I think I picked up some HR REIT and uh, Smart Center's REIT when the yield was like 11% or something ridiculous. So I bought those in my TFSA. So now I'm basically getting a 11% yield and just waiting for the stock price to recover. Um, and that entire 11% is tax-free and can compound and I can use it to buy more of whatever I want. And what to avoid in your TFSA. Now this is just my personal opinion of course, although I wouldn't hold interest or fixed income in my TFSA because although it's taxed very highly at the same rate as ordinary income, generally these types of assets pay out such a low return, like less than 1% for interest, maybe you'll get 1% or something, 1.5% on a GIC. In my opinion, I just feel like that's a waste of room in a TFSA because it's such a precious account. It's tax-free. It is a absolutely um, amazing compounding machine. And to put something so piddly that's only giving you 1% is not really worth the while. But again, that's just my opinion. Um, the second thing that I would avoid holding in your TFSA are any foreign uh, dividends. So U.S. dividends or international dividends because these are the only way you're actually going to pay tax in your TFSA. You will get that withholding tax taken out if you're holding let's say Apple stock in your TFSA when you get paid the dividend or any international stock. And the third account is the non-registered or taxable account. In this account every asset gets taxed at its uh, dictated rate and any realized gains are taxable as well. So what to hold in your taxable account? Well, capital gains, as we've talked about, are the most tax-friendly investment. So you buy a stock, you sell a stock for more. If you have to pay tax on something, you might as well hold that something that's taxed most favorably in the taxable account. Another great thing to hold in your taxable account would be Canadian dividends because we get that Canadian dividend tax credit. Uh, third to marrying rich, but second from the top. It's the next least tax investment. The third thing you might want to consider holding in your non-registered account would be questionable plays. And by that meaning, Let's say you are uh, slightly intoxicated and you decide you want to YOLO your entire portfolio into a pool noodle company. This is the account to do it because if you lose everything, at least you can claim a capital loss against your any capital other gains that you've made during the year to save some money that way so you can turn uh, a lemon into a uh, lemonade, I guess. And as far as what to avoid in your non-registered account, it would be the things that are taxed very highly, like REIT distributions, interest income, or fixed income like GICs. You are gonna be paying top dollar as far as taxes if you hold them in this account. So if I had to summarize this entire concept in one sentence, I would say in your taxable non-registered account, keep that Canadian, get your Canadian dividend payers in there, your capital gains, buying and selling stocks in there. In your TFSA, try to avoid holding US dividend paying stocks because that's the only way you're going to be paying taxes or also international, any foreign dividend paying stocks in your TFSA, because that's the only way you're going to be paying taxes uh, in a TFSA, which kind of hurts, let's be honest. And in your RRSP, if you're gonna be holding US individual stocks, that's the place to hold them because you will save on withholding tax on the dividends. And 
With all this said, there are a few things to consider like your investment time horizon, your personal tax rate, and your expected return on your investment. You know, 15 years ago, I think everybody in hindsight wishes they held Apple stock in their TFSA, even though technically it's a US dividend payer because the capital appreciation has been huge on that stock. So remember how I said this is all gravy. This is not an exact science. It's not criminal. You're not gonna go to jail if you hold Apple stock in your TFSA. But you know, if you think that a stock has a huge potential or you feel like it's totally undervalued, we all wish that we had Tesla in our TFSA in 2019 through to 2020. 20, right? So keep that in mind. None of this is an exact science. And uh, at the day, at the end of the day, you know, you win some, you lose some, but just have a little fun with your portfolio and it will kind of take the stress off over the long term. So that's it for this video. Again, if you have any questions, you can put them in the comments. You can follow me on Twitter where I post a lot of my trades, the good, the bad, and the ugly in live time. If you're kind of interested uh, in that at Mrs. Invest One. And uh, other than that, I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.